following program is brought to you by friends and partners of End Time Headlines. All right, it's Friday, April the 12th, and we want to welcome you to tonight's program. This is End Time Headlines News and Headlines from a Prophetic Perspective. Of course, I'm your host, Ricky Scaparro, the founder and the voice of End Time Headlines. We want to welcome all of our audience tonight, those watching and those listening, YouTube, Facebook, or excuse me, YouTube, Rumble, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast, wherever you're watching visually, we want to welcome you. If you're able to, in the comment section below, whatever platform you may be on, let us know in the comment section below that you're new, where you guys are joining us from. We'd love to hear from you. And before we get started, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell notification, help us push out our material so other individuals can see what we're putting out there on other platforms as well, just like you. Um, Again, we also have a free app. It's available on Apple and Android devices Uh, And platforms, if you go uh, to your Play Store, whatever that looks like for you, download our free app, hit yes to push notifications, and you're going to be squared away and good to go right there at your fingertips with every content we put out. Podcasts, prophecy, updates, headlines, everything's going to be right at your fingertips. So guys, I got a very interesting topic that I want to close this week out with uh, this week. Um, There was an article that came up. Uh, we'll, I'll pull this up here so you guys can see what I'm talking about. This was published from the Christian Post. And when I read this, it, it, it intrigued my interest. And I knew I wanted to talk about this. Now, this is going to be a very controversial subject. And I, I want to bring a disclaimer out right off the bat. We're going to talk about what happens. At, we're going to talk about what happens after an individual dies. We're talking about life after death. We're talking about experiences. And when we start talking about this, depending on what religious background you are, you will respond differently. And I'll get more into that and, and explain that in a little bit. Also, I may say some things here that may you may not agree with. Because there are some things that are absolutely speculative. They're a hypothesis because some things, a lot of things are left as a mystery. Even the Apostle Paul talks about, he talks about the mystery of this and the mystery of that. He wrote wrote seven mysteries in the New Testament. And he even goes on to say that there is some things in his writings that even himself with all of his wisdom, all of the revelation he had, his divine encounters he had with Jesus Christ himself, even on the road to Damascus, he even he could not give us definitive answers to every single thing here. So we're going to do our best, line on line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little, and we're going to try to rightfully divide the word and give you what we believe is the most logical answer to this question it's or to this topic that we're talking about. Let me read this again for you guys listening by Apple, by Spotify. Well, let me read the title of this. Christian expert on near-death experiences reveals the one thing they all have in common. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. For over three decades, John Burke has studied thousands of near-death experiences, or NDEs, that's the acronym for that, has discovered a striking commonality among them all. Every Now, this is his claim here, and we're going to elaborate more on this. Every individual, regardless of their religious background, experiences the God of the Bible. Now, hold on. I know people are going to freak out over that statement right there. Because on face value of reading this, I can see where one would be like, what? And pump the brakes. Let me read this again. His assessment is, again, he is he has studied thousands upon thousands of these near-death experiences from all religious backgrounds, every individual, all age groups, ethnicities, uh, all of it. And he says, at, regardless of all of this, They all experienced the same God of the Bible. Let me read on. Quote, I have interviewed 70 people on every continent and found that they all encountered the same God. It didn't matter culture, ethnicity, religious background. God is the God of all nations. Now, I listen to me. God is the God of all nations. Truth. 
That's an absolute truth. God is the God of all nations. Now, do all do all nations acknowledge the one true God? No. Do all the people of all the nations have a personal relationship with the one true God? The answer is no. I can take you to the book of Romans. And it talks about that they, though they knew the truth, they chose not to worship God. They turned from the truth. They carved out idols made of wood and stone, and they begin to worship them instead of the true living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord Jesus Christ. That, again, so I'm, again, we're just kind of b- breaking this down a little bit here and a little bit there, and then we're going to get to the real meat of this. According to the Christian Post, Burke, who with his wife Kathy founded Gateway Church, a multi-site church based in Austin, Texas, And just as a disclaimer, again, I don't know. I've never heard of this guy until I read this. Don't know about this church. Don't know what they believe. So don't don't hit me in the comments with all. Well, do you know this and this and that? I'm just again, I'm reading this report and I'm going to give you my opinion. Okay, so just please just listen on. Just hang on with me. Burke recounts some of these stories in his book called Imagine the God of Heaven Near Death Experiences God's Revelation and the Love You've Always Wanted. From that of a Hindu engineer who encounters a... Now, this is very important that you see this. He, uh, he, cl- he talks about a Hindu engineer who, again, he has a near-death experience and encounters a, quote, brilliant God of lightning to a nurse in Brownsville who is told by Jesus himself to spread the message of love and redemption. I really want to focus on the brilliant God of lightning. Uh, And I'm going to show you why in a minute. Burke says that uh, these stories are a part of his broader argument that near-death experiences are God's, quote, new global apologetic intended to affirm his existence. The reality of the afterlife and his desire for relationship with every person. Quote, they all say, I never wanted to leave his presence and of all the beauty I experienced. All of these great reunions with people I love who've gone on before me, nothing could compare to just being in the presence of God. Now, guys, I could, when I was doing, when I was putting this podcast together, I could have pulled up at literally hundreds of these accounts, near-death experiences, an interview here, an interview there, a witness here, and another witness there. But I realized that this was going to take a long time to filter through all these and go through this. So I chose not to do that, okay? Because But you can go research them, you can find out, and you'll see and you'll discover that what Burke is saying is true here. Okay, let me read on. He clarified that while every individual encounters the God of the Bible during a near-death experience, he is not suggesting, now listen to this, he is not suggesting that they will end up in heaven. That's very important. Now, again, if you you don't have patience and you listen to the first five minutes of this and you cut me off, you never got to this part because this is why it's important that you listen to the whole program tonight. Again, I want to I want to clarify this before you label this guy a heretic. He says that although every individual encounters the God of the Bible when they have a near death experience, he is not suggesting that all individuals end up in heaven. Burke said he does not believe these people are experiencing quote an entrance to eternity or a quote tunnel of death, but rather they are encountering, they're encountering something in between. You ready for this? I 100 and again, this is my opinion. You don't have to agree with me. That's okay. I a hundred percent agree with Burke's assessment. And I'm going to give you the Bible to confirm what I believe. Okay. In just a second. Quote, this can confuse some Christians. He said, quote, but I like to remind them that the Apostle Paul was not even a believer in Jesus and he was arresting Christians and having them jailed and killed when the same God of brilliant light. 
I want to emphasize that again, a God of brilliant light. You'll see why this is important in just a minute. Just keep all this in the back of your mind. Keep these mental notes that I'm telling you tonight. This God of brilliant light appeared to the apostle Paul. Well, actually at that time it was Saul of Tarsus on the, on the road to Damascus, Acts 9. And when Paul asked, quote, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, but Jesus didn't tell him what to do, and he didn't explain the message of the gospel to him. Now, before everybody loses their mind here, let's go back to Acts 9, and let's just see if Burke was right. Okay, so we pulled up Acts chapter 9. Here is the account of Saul having an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and it says here, Here's the whole dialogue right here. He fell to the ground, heard a voice speaking to him saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he says, then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. He goes on and, he's, and now listen to this. Saul says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now watch this. Jesus says to him, arise and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. But Jesus didn't tell him personally what he would do he said go here and we know that he ends up at a place uh at a house of ananias and ananias is a man of god ananias is a man of prayer ananias has a personal relationship with this jesus who saw had an encounter with and through intercession and through prayer it was revealed to ananias what he would speak to Saul of Tarsus. Ready? Here's what it says here. So again, Saul is being told to go to this house. You're going to see a man by the name of Ananias. He is praying. He's going to lay hands on you. You're going to receive your sight. I'm in Acts 9 11. And then Ananias says, wait a minute. This is that Saul who's been persecuting the church, burning down churches, imprisoning believers, having them, having them slain. Are you sure you've got the right guy? I'm just kind of paraphrasing this here. You can, again, this is Acts 9, 13. Um, and it says, watch this. But the Lord says to him, Acts 9, 15, go, look at this, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So watch this. The Lord reveals his purpose and his plan for Saul to Ananias, but he didn't directly give it to him on the road to Damascus with that encounter. So again, Burke is absolutely correct here. Burke went on to say that, quote, I believe God is saying to the world, I am real, true. Heaven is real, true. Hell is real, true. Now, guys, if it ruffles your feather, if it ruffles your feathers for me to tell you that God is real, heaven is real, and hell is real, then you, my friend, need to do a real thorough investigation and examination of your own heart and your doctrine and what you believe. Because if you don't believe that God is real, I question why are you even on this program and you need to get saved. Number two, if you don't believe heaven and hell is real, my goodness, what kind of church and what kind of uh, religion and denomination are you a part of that doesn't teach this stuff? Because Jesus spoke of both heaven and hell in his 42 months of his earthly ministry. And the apostles repeated this. And I'll, here in a minute, I'm going to show you in Luke 16, even more details about this. So again, Burke says, I believe God is saying to the world, I'm real. Heaven is real. Hell is real. All of these are true. And Jesus, he goes on to say, and he believes that God is saying that I love every person from every nation. True. I want you to be my child through what I did through Jesus. True. Because again, he's saying that Jesus is the only way to heaven. So he didn't say that, that there's an, all the ways are to a way to heaven. No, he is saying that Jesus is the only way to the Father. So I've, so far, guys, I have found no fault in what Burke is saying here. He's saying so that you can turn your heart back to me and be made right with me. Burke goes on to say that this is pretty cool right here. He says, as evil increases, God tends to increase his testimony on earth. And I think he's doing the same thing today. 
What I'm trying to do is show how that aligns with scriptures to convince the skeptics, but also to help Christians see what God is really like. We all put God in a box to some degree because we're, we're finning it. We're finite uh, and not infinite, he added. And yet the truth is God is way more mysterious and glorious, beautiful, grand and sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient than we could even imagine. I can't disagree with that but what does this mean and how does it affect us today god is also enjoyable personable relatable and fun now i know some of y'all struggle with that you don't think that god that jesus doesn't have a sense of humor you think he never laughs you think he never cuts up he never jokes he's always angry he's always mad he never smiles again uh, that's absolutely ridiculous, okay? Children love Jesus. The Bible talks about that. The children would always come to Jesus. The disciples try to push him away, and he says, don't despise these little ones. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. If ch uh, children are not going to be around someone that's mean, angry, and ornery, and, and, don't, and they don't like kids. I'm just saying, uh, we're, we're, a lot of people put God in a box, and Burke is correct on that. Burke also cautions against forming theological beliefs solely on the basis of near-death experiences. I love that. I want to highlight that again. Burke cautions against forming theological beliefs based on a near-death experience. In other words, translation, it, it has to line up with the Bible. Okay? If you're an, if you're because listen uh, now I'm going to get into a little angle of this but we're going to get deeper into this if you're if if a apparition appears to you a spirit being appears to you and tells you to do something contrary to the Bible that is not the word and that is not of God why do you think listen to me why do you think the Apostle Paul warned in his in one of his letters, he said, if any man comes into you and preaches another gospel, he says, and he goes a step further. He said, if we or even an angel from heaven appears preaching any other gospel unto you than what we have preached, he said, he even goes and says, if someone comes and in another Jesus, if, if they preach another Jesus, another doctrine or another spirit that's not in line with the word of God. He says, count them accursed. Now I can tell, listen, there is two major religions that has millions of followers around the world that were formed out of this very deception. Both individuals claim that angels appeared unto them both individuals claim that the angels told them things that were contrary to the Bible. One is the prophet Muhammad and the other is Joseph Smith. Again, I, that's all I'm going to say there. You go research, research it yourself. And I, I find it very interesting that Jesus warned before Muhammad had his encounter in Mecca in Saudi Arabia, where he formed Islam. He warned before Joseph Smith began to write all of his new, his another testament of Jesus Christ, forming the church of the Latter-day Saints. Before that, ever, again, both men claim, you go read their, their own testimonies. Both men claim to have encounters with angels from God. One was Moroni. The other one was the allegedly the angel Gabriel. And again, both of these angels told these men things that don't line up with Scripture. So again, that's what Burke is emphasizing here. He goes on to say that noting the risk of encountering questionable accounts as they gain popularity. Instead, he differentiated what people report from their personal interpretations influenced by their cultural or religious backgrounds. So guys, this guy's done his homework for here. He gives an example. For instance, Burke recounted the story of Nia, a, who is a teenager from Africa who followed a near-death experience described, now listen to this, described encountering, encountering a being of light, a being of light. She identified as the goddess Durga, despite the experience closely mirroring the Christian understanding of God. Now, friend, I'm going to tell you, listen, here's why it is 
imperative that we know the word of God. And again, I'm dovetailing right off of what we're talking about here. Remember how I kept telling you to take a mental note and highlight angel of light and encounter with light, a God of light. Somebody say light. Here's why I'm going to show you some stuff. Look at this. This is in second Corinthians chapter 11. If you're following along with me on Spotify, we're in second Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For listen what Paul, the apostle, warned the church of Corinth. For such are false apostles and and, and deceitful workers. And by the way, we've got a whole program lined up next week, and we're going to highlight that. False apostles, deceitful workers, transform themselves into apostles of light. You don't want to miss it. We got a whole segment next week. It's coming. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Now look at what it says here, verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself, what does that say, church? Transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Guys, listen to me. We we have these depictions of Satan formed in our minds that has been given to us by Hollywood sensation. Uh, Sensational movies, horror films, series, comic books, illustrations, uh, video games, and the list goes on and they all, they give us these descriptions of what our, so our mental brain for years. When you talk about well, what does Satan look like? Everybody would immediately get a picture of, uh, of this man in a red costume with devil horns and a little spaded tail on the back and a pitchfork in his hand. That is not what Satan looks like. That is Satan And before he fell was called Lucifer. The Bible calls him the anointed cherub. He is not only a cherub. He was the anointed cherub. He is the head honcho of the empire and kingdom of darkness. But the Bible says he will he will manifest himself as an angel of light. He, oh, come on, somebody. I, I hope somebody's listening to me today. He, he will try to deceive the masses through appearing as something that can be embraced. Oh, it's, I, such, I saw such a brilliant light. It, was, it, it felt so warm. It felt, it felt so fuzzy. It felt so good. And he was, and, but then, listen, if you know the Bible, I want to know what comes out of this angel of light's mouth. If what comes out of its mouth begins to pull me away from, come on, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it pulls me away from the word of God. It pulls me away from the fact that there is no other way unto heaven, but through Jesus Christ. If this being, this apparition, this spirit, this angel, this messenger, whatever appears while you're in your hospital bed, while you're in your car that you just had a car accident and you're at the verge and you're at the precipice of dying and stepping into eternity, whatever the case would be, if you have this encounter and this thing speaks to you and tells you something that contradicts this Bible and lies straight, because remember the Bible calls Lucifer, Satan, the father of lies, then friends, we have to reject that. It's the same thing with aliens, friend. Quote, aliens. I, you, I know you guys can't see me on Apple, Spotify, but I'm doing the air quotes because I don't believe in aliens as green, gray, celestial, or I should say extraterrestrial beings. They're nothing more than if there is beings appearing and manifesting to people. And if we, as some claim that we have, uh, we have encountered or we have in our possession as in America, these, uh, these beings, these, these, uh, uh, out of this world humanoids, 
If that's the case, if that's true, that doesn't shake my faith. I, these are simply demons in, in the flesh. They're, the Bible calls them Nephilims. And, and again, I wouldn't be surprised if they continue with an increase of deception based on second Thessalonians chapter two. But here's what I find interesting. These people, and I've researched this, I've studied this guys, and I've seen the quote unquote encounters and the testimonies of people that were allegedly abducted by these quote unquote aliens. Do you, here's something you'll never hear. You won't hear this on discovery channel. You won't hear this on the science channel. You won't hear this on those, those channels that always promote these you know, the, the alien propaganda, you never hear about this, but there has been countless stories where in which believers had an alleged encounter with one of these aliens and they begin to name the name of Jesus. They begin to rebuke that being in Jesus name. And when they did that, that being exited the room it left the premises. It disappeared. Now, I wonder why. Oh, I'm going to tell you why. Because there's no other name given under heaven unto men in which we must be saved. I'm going to tell you why. The Bible says that God has given him the name that is above every name. Come on, everything that can be named. Things in heaven, things in earth, things in sea, in the sea, things in the dry land, things under the sea. That everything must bow its knee and it must Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that means even a stupid three foot gray being that the world calls an alien. So again, guys, we're trying to sharpen your sword, get your discernment up, because I'm telling you, deception is rampant in these last days. But I'm going to throw a different angle at this. OK, now I want to go to a different angle. And I believe again, I believe that's what that that girl encountered. It was because she was in a place where the gospel was probably being suppressed and she didn't hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So she was only she only had an understanding of these false gods. So one of them tried to appear to her and try to solidify the deception and try to make her believe that, you know, she can continue to put her faith and her trust in a false God, G, little G. That when she died, she'd go and spend eternity with this quote unquote God or goddess. Okay, that's that that's I'm telling you, that's what's going on here. But now I'm gonna go back to let's go back to the beginning of this article. I want to pull this up because we're gonna take a whole different angle on this. Watch this. It's, so we've got that part. So you got the deception, you got demons, you got Lucifer deceiving people. But then remember, Burke said here that. He said he's interviewed all these individuals across the continent, all over the world, thousands of experiences. And he says every individual, regardless of the religious background, experiences the God of the Bible. Now, remember, he goes on to say that he doesn't believe. He said it's an in-between place between earth and eternity, whether that be heaven or whether that be hell. Now, what do I base that upon? I base that. On Hebrews 9 27, where in which it says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. The Apostle Paul said in his letter, his second letter to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said that if our earthly house, which is this body, is destroyed, that we have a building from God that's a resurrected body which is a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, listen to this, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall be found, uh, we shall not be found naked. He goes on. I mean, let me pull this up since we're reading this. He goes on to say, if indeed, uh, for, for we who are in this tent, this is uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 4, for we who are in this tent, in this flesh, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the spirit as a guarantee. This is the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us if we're born again. So we are always confident, verse 6, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. 
For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased. Now look what he says here. Rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Let me say that again. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now listen, if you're watching this and you are of the religious background of Mormonism or Seventh-day Adventists, now I use them too because they are the, the main culprits of preaching a doctrine called soul sleep. Now guys, listen, I don't have time to, to preach a 45 minutes 45 minute message debunking soul sleep. We, if you're interested in that, we did a podcast on that where we dedicated the entire podcast on debate or debunking, excuse me, soul sleep, the doctrine of soul sleep. Uh, again, that is highly uh, pro, uh, taught and held by Mormons and Seventh day Adventists, and where in which they believe. And guys, again, we go into all the details on that podcast. So please go find the archives. We talk about Ellen G. White, who is the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist. She has 28 key teachings of the Adventist church. And one of them is the concept of soul sleep. They believe it's a, and I'm going to give you the, the real cliff notes of this because we don't have time to expel on this. It is a state of unconscious before the second coming of Christ. It's a belief that after a person dies, his or her soul quote unquote sleeps until the resurrection and final judgment. Again, the, this concept guys is not biblical. They will claim that the dead remain in graves and there's no spirit. There's no soul which goes to heaven or hell. When we die, this in a nutshell is the doctrine of soul sleep. Now guys, we again go before you start blasting us in the comments. You need to go watch the podcast because I can bring scriptures up in the book of revelation. For example, I'll give you one real quick example in the book of revelation. John saw under the throne, the souls that were beheaded for their testimony to Jesus Christ. He also sees souls that are in a place in paradise. By the way, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that Paul describes where heaven now is prior to that, but prior to the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, paradise used to be in an inward compartment, a place under the earth called Abraham's bosom, you can find that in Luke chapter 16. There was a great gulf fix that separated a compartment on the bottom and a compartment above. The unrighteous that died in their sins were held in a compartment under uh, in the bottom portion of this where in which they were in torment. But in the upper compartment where the beggar died, Luke 16, he was in comfort and he was in rest. Both men, when they died, had all five senses operating. They could see, they could smell, they could hear, they could feel, and they had their memory. The, 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 um, the rich man that died knew that if his brothers did not repent, that they would end up in this place. And he begged Abraham to send, to send him to preach to them. It's all in Luke 16. Now, again, the, 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 the Mormons, the Adventists, the Jehovah Witnesses, and many other denominations out there and religious groups will try to convince you that Luke 16 was a parable, but it is not a parable. Go, every parable that Jesus spoke, the Bible says, and he spoke unto them a parable. And in another parable, he said this. And yet another parable, he said that. But Luke 16 says that there was a man named Lazarus. There was a beggar. They were known in their day and their community. And the whole reason why that story is presented is because Jesus is, was warning a generation that when you die, and everybody will, unless you are raptured out, unless we are the ones on the earth that are blessed to be caught up, we're the, uh, if we're the blessed ones that are in the group of, and those that are alive and remain shall be caught up. Unless we're not in that group, friends, 
We are going to see physical death. And the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And my friends, when you die, you think because the medical industry, the experts in the medical field have told you that when your heart stops beating, that you clinically die. But guys, I'm going to tell you, I've come by to tell you today that that is not the absolute to determine your death there. Again, there has been hundreds of thousands of accounts of people whose their hearts were stopped. They died. They clinically died. And when they died, listen to me, they saw things and heard things that it was impossible for them to be able to hear it be able to see it and be able to experience it because the quote unquote experts have convinced you, even you Christians that you don't experience that stuff. Guys, I know people personally that died on operating tables. They had an accident. They had a procedure and they died for a a certain amount of time or they were in a coma and they would give, they would tell these accounts where their soul and their spirit, first Thessalonians 5, 23, the Bible says that you are made up of a triune being. You are body, soul, and spirit. When these individuals were in a state of a coma or they were quote unquote clinically dead for a certain amount of time, I can't tell you how many, and I know some of these personally, their soul and spirit came out of their body They were elevated above the bed. Then where which they they saw their own body laying on the bed. Some of them, there's there's one story where the individual went out of the room, went up a hallway in the hospital, went to a prayer chapel and saw their own mother weeping and praying before God that God would spare them. Now, they're, again, their physical body, guys, is laying there dead on the, on the, on the table or they're in a coma. And their, their soul and spirit is seeing things going around in the hospital. They're seeing doctors saying things. They're seeing procedures going on. And then when they come back into their bodies and they're able to sit around and have a discussion and give an account of what they saw while they were, quote, unquote, clinically dead, they stun the medical professionals. Because they will say, I heard you say this to that nurse. I saw this doctor come in. He had a chart and he said, we're going to have to do this and do that. I saw my mother. She was in the prayer chapel. She was wearing a red dress. She was weeping. She was crying. She said this and that and this. She said, oh God. And she would, and he, and this individual would recite everything that they said. Now, look, I know I'm destroying. Now I'm, I'm destroying some of y'all's theology. Well, I don't believe that happened, Brother Ricky. I don't really care. Listen, that if you don't know by now, I am not intimidated by your opinions. I'm just letting you know, guys. My own grandmother, this now this is personal to me. My grandmother is one of the most godliest women I ever knew. She had a prayer life. She had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, she would have encounters with God, that God would speak to her things. I remember right before she passed away, it was on Thanksgiving and she came, I was, uh, we would all gather at my mother's house on Thanksgiving. It was a tradition. And my grandmother came out of the room. It was me sitting there and my two aunts sitting there. My grandmother walks in the room and she says, uh, and she spoke to my, she said, Mary, Josie, that, that was their names. She said, she goes, I believe the Lord appeared to me last night. And when she said that, I perked up my ears and said, "Uh oh, I, I want to hear this. And she said, I believe the Lord spoke to me last night or appeared to me in my dream and called me by name, which her name was Catherine and said, Catherine, set your house in order for soon you will come and be with me. And she told my aunts that were sitting there, all of us, I was in the room. And they kind of, and now look, uh, my mom was backslid at the time. I, I don't 
I'm not ashamed to tell you that. It's just the truth. She would tell you if she was standing here today, she was backslid. But my other aunt was not backslid. But neither one of them really took what she said seriously. And I had to pull them aside. Now, some of y'all has heard this story before, but bear with this. Bear with those who have not heard this story. They, I pulled them aside and I said, listen, y'all need to listen to what she's saying because I think this. if this is true, if she really had this encounter, then something's about to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but something's going to happen and she's going to slip into eternity. And this is why, and God's given her a time to prepare or he wouldn't have said, set your house in order for soon you'll be with me. I mean, how think about that, guys. How merciful and good is God that he allowed her to prepare for stepping into eternity? Some people never get that chance. Come on. Some people, they they have a, a cocky attitude, like they, nothing can touch them. And then one day they're in a the car, they're on the interstate, and boom, a car accident. They never had a chance to repent. They never had a chance to turn back to God. That's why I always tell people, don't play with that stuff. We do not know what tomorrow will bring. But in this case, in some cases, God, don't ask me why, but listen, <clears throat> She was a praying woman. I know she had a really close relationship. But listen, Abraham was called a friend of God. He had an intimate relationship with God. No, I don't. Listen, I'm not necessarily saying God has favorites, but also I'm saying that this, that the Bible says, draw near unto him and he'll draw near unto you. He is a, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He says, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Listen, if you want more of him, he's waiting on you. You're not waiting on him. He's waiting on you. He's always there waiting to commune with you and fellowship with you. And so basically, so what I'm saying is there's things that will only be found in those intimate encounters with God. But listen, don't miss the point. Shortly after that, shortly after that event, I'm talking about probably a month after that, my, my grandmother's health began to decline. Her cognitive function began to decline. They did a series of tests, found out she had Alzheimer's. And and immediately I I told my my aunt and I told my mother, I said, there it is. God warned her, said, set your house in order, get ready. And then about six months later, guys, I mean, she declined quickly. Six months later, she's laying there on her deathbed, on her back. We're all there at the house. My aunt's in the room. There's two of my aunts in the room. My mother's in the room. She's laying there on her back, on her bed. She's got her arms up in the air and she's looking at the ceiling and she's having a full-blown conversation. Now, I know some of the skeptics and the atheists and the unbelievers will say, well, she was losing her mind. She was just hallucinating. She was seeing things. But she was, she would, every now and then she'd stop and say, no, I'm not ready yet. Tell them not to come for me. I'm not ready to go yet. That's what she kept saying. I'm not ready to go yet. She would be looking up into the ceiling, looking up into the heavens. I'm not ready to go. Hold them back. Don't let them come get me yet. I'm waiting. Now, here's what I want to tell you. She did not die until my last aunt flew in from New York, which was her last daughter, so that she could say goodbye. And when my aunt come into the room and said her goodbyes, my grandmother... Everyone was there. My grandmother then looks up to the ceiling and says, okay, Lord, now they can come. I'm ready. And within seconds, my friend, she gave up the spirit. Now, what in the world was going on there, Brother Ricky? Was she hallucinating? No. Was she having, uh, was she, uh, was she losing it in her mind? Absolutely not. I'm going to tell you what, what was going on in the book of Luke 16. It tells us that when the beggar died, look what it says right here. Verse 22, Luke 16, 22. So it was that the beggar died. He's dead, right? Look what it says. He was carried by, what's it say, church? He was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. Now listen to me. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that he, when he, before he first ascended, 
he first descended. He went into the lower parts of the earth and led captivity captive. What in the world does that mean? He went into the lower compartments of the earth, preached to the spirits of the dead. I'm in your Bible, by the way, so you can fact check it all you want. He preached to the spirits of the dead and led captivity captive. Where did he go into the lower parts of the earth? He went into Abraham's bosom and preached that Jesus Christ, not the law, law of Moses, but Jesus Christ is now the way to heaven and the new paradise would no longer be down below, but it would be second Corinthians chapter 12, where the apostle Paul was stoned to, to, to be left for dead in Lystria. And he was the saints gathered around him, prayed for him. God raised him from the dead and he gives him, he writes out his whole near death experience. The apostle Paul, this wrote this down, second Corinthians 12. And he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. And he says, I know a man. And he's speaking of himself and his own account. He said, I, he saw things that are not even lawful for me. And he's he talking about that. And it is not even lawful for me to tell you. I can't even, I, God will not even permit me to tell you these things. And he says in there in second Corinthians chapter 12, let me pull it up. Look what it says here. Uh, verse four, he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for me to utter caught up into paradise. Where is paradise? It is not below. It is not in Abraham's bosom anymore. It is above and it's in heaven. John saw this place and it was where these saints, it's where these individuals were that have, come on, they've already passed on. They've died in Christ. They were martyred in Christ. He sees them under the throne room of God. And by the way, I don't think I got to this point to dispel. One of the arguments to dispel soul sleep was pray and tell me if our soul and spirit is in the grave and not with the, in the presence of the Lord. Pray and tell me how did John see souls in heaven and they were making conversation right here. Let me let me show you this. When he opened the fifth seal again, this is in the tribulation, guys. This is not at the, this is before the judgment seat of, uh, uh, of the, the, the great white throne judgment. This is before that. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, under the altar, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now we can argue, was this during the tribulation? Was it before the tribulation? It doesn't even, it doesn't matter on the account of the argument I'm making here or the point I'm making. Here's the point. There was souls in heaven, not in the grave. And they had a voice because it says in verse 10, they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth. I'm going to rock your theology right now. Not only were they in heaven after they died, not only did they have a voice in which they could speak, but number three, how did they have recollection and how did they have knowledge and understanding of things going on in the earth? All right, so I got to get to my final point. Come on, I, are you enjoying this as much as I am to preach this? Let me get to this article again. I want to bring up one final point. This is very, now this one's going to be controversial. And again, this last point I'm making, now the first two things I, are again, that's my opinion. Now this last part is a hypothesis that I want to present to you. Now in this article for the Christian Post, uh, Burke clarified that while every individual encounters the God of the Bible during a near-death experience, he is not suggesting that we end up in heaven. Burke said he doesn't believe these people are experiencing an entrance into eternity or a tunnel of death. Of death. Rather, they're encountering, quote, something in between. Now, that brings me to the final point I want to make on this segment, and that is this. This goes right along with the title. What... Do all of these near-death experiences have in common? You ready for this? All of them, almost every one of them, despite what religious background they are, what ethnicity, what age, whatever, they all claim to have an encounter with light. They saw a bright light. It was warm. It was so peaceful. It was like 
and the guys, I can tell you, tell you so many of them say, it was like, they'll, they'll say, this light was like judging me. It was showing me the secrets of my heart. It was showing me all the things of my life. And it was such warmth and it was such comfort. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay in this presence. Guys, there is a scripture in the book of 1 Timothy, <clears throat> excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 through 17. I got to show you this scripture. Here it is. Ready? In 1 Timothy 6, 16. The Apostle Paul says, God, and he talks about Jesus Christ here, is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, look what it says here, dwelling in unapproachable light. Remember I kept telling you, take that mental note of the word light. Paul says that he dwells in an unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see. Now I'm about to blow you away. If you've, some of you have never seen this before. So this is going to rock your world. But I believe the man who the Bible calls the wisest man, the, and in his day, he was the wisest man in the earth. I'm talking about the son of David, King Solomon. In Solomon's a book he wrote in Ecclesiastes. He made a profound statement that I believe could be the secret, the, the, the answer to unlock the reasoning why. How come a Hindu sees the light? The Buddhist sees the light. The Muslim sees the light. Those who worship Confucius, the, even atheists and agnostics, some of them, not all of them, some of them see this light. They didn't even believe in God, but they see this light. They experience this light. Remember, Paul said, God dwells in an in, inapproachable light. Jesus, God says, no man can see my face and live. Yeah, I can take you to the Bible where it says that if God was to reveal if the father was to reveal his face to the earth, it would burn and consume up nations. So we were able to see the face of the father through Jesus Christ in the flesh. Come on. When he was, Oh, come on. Don't get me in the book of John. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. But watch this. Look at Ecclesiastes. I'm going to pull this up for you real quick. Here's what it says. In verse six, Solomon begins to talk about death and he says something very profound here. I'm going to read this and then we're going to elaborate. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed. What? Let me say that again. Solomon says, now if Solomon's talking, I'm listening. This guy, again, when God said, you can have it all, Solomon, what do you want? He said, give me wisdom. Remember your creator, he said, before the silver cord is loosed. What the heck is this silver cord? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Watch this. Let's read on. Or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. Then he says, then after this, after these events, then the dust will return to the earth as it was. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. Now, guys, how many of you can agree with Brother Ricky that this entire passage right here that you're looking at is speaking of death? If you if you disagree with that, guys, I don't know how you could disagree with that. All of this is talking about death. But Solomon makes this strange connection between when an individual dies and a silver cord being loosed and we're to remember our creator because once the silver cord is loosed, it is cut, then we pass from mortal to immortality in whatever state that looks like for you. If you, again, 
If you don't know the Lord, my friend, this is, I, I, by the way, we're landing this plane right now. This is our closing right now. This is the altar call. We're going to give, we're going to pray for some folks here. If you, if you got invited in this program or somebody uh, uh, shared this with you because they think you need to hear this, you need to stick around and listen to what I'm telling you. I believe after studying this, that just as it, when we are born into this physical world, Everyone listening, I don't care how old you are, young you are, age, ethnicity, it don't matter. When you were born, when you came out of your mother's womb, you had something connected to you that was supplying blood, oxygen, and essential nutrients to keep you alive, and it's called an umbilical cord. Come on, talk to me. What is the first thing a doctor does once a baby comes out with the umbilical cord? They loose the cord. And once the cord is loosed, then the child that is born is now, come on, is on, on their own and they have to breathe on their own, function on their own. Their bone marrow has to produce the blood for them. They have now become a separate individual from their mother. Guys, is it possible? This makes so much sense to me. Again, I know some people's going to disagree, and that's okay. You Listen, I'm trying to pull as much scripture as again. Remember, I told you, Paul even talks about there is mysteries in the Bible that you're never going to figure out. That's why I love, I hope you guys enjoy these as much as I do because I am a sponge to learn things. I want to know, and I get a kick out of these people that are so dogmatic and will tell you, there is no this and there's no that, and they act like they've got everything figured out. I'm the first one to tell you guys, there is, there is things of my theology that has evolved from when I first got saved 24 years ago to it is now. I definitely, there's a lot of things I believe now that I didn't believe then, or I don't believe now that I did then. Why? Because I am always searching and, and, and praying and seeking the word of God and digging and trying to find the word of truth. Having said that, is it possible that just as in the natural, there is a cord that has to be loosed, is there a spiritual, or I should say this, is there a cord in the spirit somehow connected to our soul and spirit that is attached to our bodies that as long as the cord is connected, then it doesn't matter if the heart stops. Because as long as the soul, as long as the cord is connected, holding the soul and spirit in the body, then there's still life in the body. Even after 18 minutes, 23 minutes, 16 minutes, five minutes, a coma, whatever the case would be, they come back and they say, I was up above my bed. I was walking around. It makes sense because the cord was still attached. And you say, well, this is, this is ridiculous, brother Ricky. I don't know if I can believe this. Well, I do know this. When... The beggar died, Luke 16. He was carried into Abraham's bosom by angels. Why would angels need to come to do that? Could it be, and again, I'm throwing this out there. Could it be possible that, it, that, it, that when an individual gets ready to slip? And by the way, that's, I believe 100% with all my heart. What my grandmother saw and multitudes of others, I could sit here, guys, for an hour and just tell you testimonies. I had a good friend of mine that was 23 years old. He had a, um, he was either 21 or 23. He had a wife and a daughter, and he died of lymphoma cancer. I was there at his bedside when he died. I was, I could tell you all these stories of individuals that I personally know and personal encounters and experiences were, that, that were believers in the Lord and they saw things, experienced things, even heard music playing. 
and before they passed on to eternity. I believe what my grandmother was seeing and she kept saying, tell them to hold them back, hold them back. Don't tell them to come get me yet. I'm not ready. I believe it was the angels of the Lord that God was sending. Come on to carry her into second Corinthians chapter 12 paradise. Is it possible that the angels of the Lord are the ones responsible for loosing the cord? And once the cord is loosed, then that individual passes. You ready for this? I'm going to pull all this together. This would explain, ready? Once they pass beyond the light, then and only then will they truly go to their final destination, which will be upward into a paradise in heaven to rest until the end of all things. Again, 2 Corinthians 12, Revelation talks about that. All that, the beam of judgment where believers are judged. We are, believers are not judged at the great right throne judgment. We're judged at the beam in heaven. By the way, that happens in the tribulation. Now, how in the world, if you believe that the church is going to go through the tribulation, I don't know, I don't know how you're going to make it to the beam of judgment because that happens during the tribulation. But anyway, that's a whole other study. But watch this. But if you don't know the Lord and you don't have a relationship with Christ and you pass beyond that light that no man can approach and no man can see, if the cord is loosed, and you go beyond that realm and you don't know Jesus Christ, then my friends, the Bible makes it clear that you will go to a place of confinement, which is called Hades or hell. Isaiah said that hell has enlarged itself. How did it enlarge itself? Because Abraham's bosom was removed. Therefore, it enlarged itself to capacitate the amount of individuals that will go there. Jesus made it clear in his teachings on the earth that he said, narrow and straight is the way into eternal life and few be that find it. He said, but wide and broad is the path to destruction and many be that go into it. Guys, this makes so much sense to me. This, this is why everybody sees the light. Because God is the author and finisher. God is the God of the, he is the judge of the universe. The Bible says that God has appointed Jesus Christ to judge men. Solomon said, listen, if you could scroll down in that same chapter I was in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, you scroll down. Here's, I love what Solomon says. After all, he, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, he's talked about all under the sun is vanity. And he talks about all these things. And he says, let us, con let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What in the world could be the conclusion of the whole matter? Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Guys, here's the bottom line. I come by to tell again, we may have some disagreements in here and there. But here's the bottom line. I'm going to say what Solomon said. Here's the conclusion of all matter. And this is your altar call. If you're watching, you're listening, you're away from God, you don't know God, you've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe you're boxing, whatever the case would be. Friends, the day will come. You may live to be 100 years old. You may live another week. You, you may die today. It's the reality. Life is a vapor. We're here today, gone tomorrow. If you... Listen, if you need to get right with God, now's your chance. I'm going to pray for you right now. Come on, let's pray right now. Father in heaven, I've delivered this word. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this word would equip, it would convict, and it would charge those that are watching and listening on the other side of this camera, on the other side of this microphone. If there be any individual that is away from you, they don't know you, they're backslid. I pray that the Holy Spirit would draw them unto repentance. They would put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, the only way to heaven. There's no other name given under heaven unto men in which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. I pray that they'd make that decision today. I pray for them today, God. I pray that you would, that their hearts 
would be pliable, that they would not harden their hearts as many did and for their destruction, but Lord, that you would take out of them a heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh, even right now in this broadcast. Lord, I pray that tears would begin to flow. Lord, that people's lives would be transformed and changed and people would come back to you. The backsliders, the, the prodigals would come back home and the sinners would be, come on, regenerated and be born again and all of heaven rejoices even in the presence of angels over one sinner that says yes in this broadcast. And I pray this today and, 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 and everyone of God's people agree today and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Listen guys, endtimeheadlines.org, endtimeheadlines.com. Again, free app available on Apple and Android. Pick it up today. It'll be a great blessing to you, I promise to you. And again, if you'd like to support this ministry, partner with our ministry, you can do it two different ways. You can give electronically through the app or through the main website, or you can make your check or money order out to write there on your screen at End Time Headlines, P.O. Box 1391, Monroe, Georgia, 30655. I hope you've had a blessed uh, evening uh, being with us. It's been a great honor to, to be able to pour into many of you guys. We love you guys. We're going to be off for the weekend. We'll be right back here, Lord willing, on Monday night, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. By the way, Tuesday night, we were hoping and planning to be back on with Larry Raglan because we didn't able, we're not, we were not able to do that this week. So we're looking forward to doing that next week. So we've got a whole lineup for next week. So until then, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, and may his countenance shine upon you. We'll see you soon. Thank you for listening to the End Time Headlines podcast. We pray that you've been blessed and equipped by today's message. For more information about how you can help partner with our ministry, please visit endtimeheadlines.org.